All right, let's do our first web lecture. I'd like to talk about the history of evolutionary thought, both before and since Darwin. This is a favorite topic of mine, but I'll try to keep this short. Evolutionary thinking ha goes back at least a century or two before Darwin. And I have a couple of objectives in uh, briefly reviewing this. I'd like you to understand the history of the study of natural history and some of the logic in the classical naming system, the Linnaean system. I'd like you to understand the assumptions underlying special creation and be able to discuss why it's difficult to test them scientifically and to explain how questioning the assumptions of special creation paved the way for evolutionary thinking and essentially all of modern biology and to describe how evolutionary thinking prior to Darwin led to, but differed from, Darwin's theory. All right, so people have been naming organisms as long as we've been able to speak uh, and eat. Mushrooms may be quite tasty, but these um, death caps on the left, although delicious, uh, will lead to a painful death over a two-week period as they stifle all uh, RNA synthesis in your body. Well, these ones on the right, to my mind, although they won't kill you, don't taste particularly good. And as long as we've been social speaking creatures, we've likely named the organisms we eat. But in the time of Linnaeus, naming organisms took on new significance. Linnaeus worked early, about 100 years after European conquest, contact 200 years after European contact with the New World. And as explorers in uh, Spain, Portugal, France, England, the Netherlands, and Sweden brought back organisms from the New World, from Africa, the Americas, they found organisms that looked very similar in different places. There are maples and beeches and pines in both North America and Europe, as well as Asia. And they differ from one another, even though um, we can all recognize them with almost no biological training as maples. The same is true of things like the European and the North American fox, the gray and the red fox. They all look like a fox, as, as do different Arctic foxes or silver foxes, uh, but they're clearly distinct from one another as well. Linnaeus came up with a system to name this diversity, one that we still use. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, etc. At the time of Linnaeus, people believed in special creation. And these uh, series of, say, maples or foxes created some problem for it. But a bigger problem was perhaps extinction. So as people mined, they found organisms that no longer existed. Uh, for, for which there was a bone, but it clearly looked like nothing that anyone had ever observed alive. And a French uh, scientist, uh, Georges Cuvier, uh, became the Pope of Bones at the museum in Paris, where one of the large collections of them accumulated. And he documented a number of extinctions, both in uh, mastodons and mammoths, uh, but in other uh, species. He did not think that species evolved. He uh, believed in uh, special creation, uh, but he believed that extinctions were the result of periodic catastrophes followed by uh, new creations. As the fossil record built up, however, uh, others questioned uh, this thinking. Uh, but Cuvier represents one philosophical extreme, catastrophism, that... Um, there have been periodic catastrophes through geological time. And some people still will pick up on parts of his uh, thinking. Another problem of special creation beyond extinction is the age of the Earth. Lyle, uh, a prominent uh, 19th century geologist, uh, was critical in synthesizing uh, geological thinking that questioned uh, the age of the Earth. Uh, he was uh, the foremost geologist of the day, uh, and so much of his thinking as a uniformitarian remains uh, critical. He was a friend and colleague of Darwin's, although really a generation earlier, and one of Darwin's professors at Cambridge. He thought the Earth was older than 300 million years old, 
And part of this was that he, he was a uniformitarian. He believed that the geological features we observe today are due to the same processes that we can observe today working over a period of millions of years. So th this approach, uniformitarian, is an intellectual contrast to catastrophism in that he believed th th uniformitarians uh, believe that we um, processes or periods uh, processes are similar uh, over geological time. In modern geology, these two uh, modes of thinking often uh, complement each other, and although they're contrasts. Uh, the distinction is perhaps blurred in that we know there are infrequent events like volcanic eruptions that occur due to processes we can observe every day and they're not at odds with one another even if a single volcano or earthquake may have a very large effect um, with a slower process such as erosion coming after it. In Christian thinking the age of the earth um, had uh, for a long time been based on biblical thinking and the Archbishop Usher uh, in Ireland used uh, a calculation of uh, the lifespan of different figures in the Old Testament to date creation back to the 23rd of October in 4000 BC. This is a, in some ways a, a line of Christian thinking that uh, remains vibrant uh, today uh, although uh, it's clear in reading the Old Testament that the ages of uh, some of the older individuals are um, not in line with modern lifespans. And it's clear to those who uh, take the time to read the Hebrew that really much of the writing is um, fantastic and um, not to be taken literal. It's clearly allegorical uh, writing that uh, translates badly into English. Uh, it, it simply doesn't mean exactly uh, what it's translated. Nonetheless, there is a, a intellectual tradition of uh, timing creation this way. This timing is clearly at odds with any modern understanding of geology, where uh, the processes that we observe, be they catastrophic or gradual, uh, clearly require an older Earth. Hutton, another uh, prominent Scottish geologist in Lyle, used the ages of rock formations uh, in England and across the world uh, to, to try to date uh, how old the Earth must be. And they came up with estimates based on how quickly erosion or sedimentation occur that the Earth must be at least 300 million years old, and likely much older. Darwin uh, used this date as it was the, the best estimate uh, at the time he was writing The Origin. But it was a matter of debate. Uh, Lord Kelvin, another uh, English physicist, used the temperature of rocks and a known rate of cooling to estimate a much younger Earth of only 20 million years. Now it turns out, and this was uh, so discovered a few years after Kelvin wrote, that his estimates were flawed. He assumed the Earth was a solid, spherical body, uh, and he ignored the fact that much of the Earth is molten, dynamic, and the, the nature of uh, tectonic plates uh, moving on top of a molten core uh, changes that cooling estimate. We now know, based on radiological decay uh, in a better sense of geography, that the Earth is uh, well over 4, million, 4 billion years old. All right, so many before Darwin, such as Linnaeus, observed uh, a pattern, a diversity of living things. They noted fossil diversity uh, a as well as patterns of diversity in living things. Several people, uh, including uh, Georges Louis Leclerc, the, the Comte de Buffon, and Darwin's own grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, proposed that organisms changed through time. Few, neither of them, however, uh, proposed a mechanism uh, that drove this pattern or a process underlying the pattern. The first person to do this was Lamarck, uh, who uh, came up with the, the idea of acquired characteristics to explain 
patterns of diversity. And this is the first real evolutionary theory. He believed in the inheritance of acquired traits, such that uh, giraffes reaching their neck higher up into a canopy uh, would therefore lead to uh, their offspring having longer necks because they stretch their own. Uh, this idea suggests that organisms are shaped by their environment and that changes made during a lifetime occur through use or disuse and that these changes are inherited uh, therefore by offspring and that organisms evolve from simple to complex. Much of uh, Lamarck's thinking builds out of the philosophy of uh, Immanuel Kant, a German thinker of uh, the 18th century uh, who had a lot of teleological thinking in his philosophy. All right, so Linnaeus, Cuvier uh, both made uh, essential contributions to thinking that led to evolution, although neither of them believed that species were transmutable, even though uh, Linnaeus observed in much of his work hybrids among different species that suggest, and their offspring, that suggest that species are in fact transmutable. Buffon and Erasmus Darwin both paved the way for popular acceptance of species transmutability, although neither developed a process to uh, explain the pattern. Lamarck and Lyell both made significant contributions to our understanding of process uh, in explaining uniformitarian uh, processes and the possibility that some mechanism may underlie species transmutation. But none of them uh, put the piece together. And this is where Darwin's uh, work is so important in uh, generating a mechanism that's uh, testable uh, and that is held up against uh, uh, 150 years of tests uh, to explain how natural selection and other processes can lead to evolution over time. Darwin's work, however, occurred uh, outside in no vacuum. It was uh, po a subject of intense popular debate as soon as his book came out. Uh, some uh, thought that uh, <laughs> uh, w one popular quote is, my dear, I trust that it is not true, but if it is, let us pray that it will not become generally known. There were some who were shocked by the theory. Uh, Samuel Wilberforce, uh, the Bishop of Oxford, was one uh, who famously said, is it through your grandfather or your grandmother that you, that you claim your descent from a monkey? Darwin himself was quite shy and was in many ways a social uh, recluse. Although uh, quite wealthy and very well connected, uh, he in many ways did not want the attention that came with this theory. A much more public uh, uh, defender was his friend Thomas Henry Huxley, uh, famously known as Darwin's Bulldog, uh, who took uh, on much of the uh, public face of the theory. And he said in response, I would not be ashamed to have a monkey for my ancestor, but I would be ashamed to be connected with a man who used his great gifts to obscure the truth. Uh, and Huxley was uh, perhaps the most vocal proponent uh, during the life of Darwin for Darwin's theory. There was popular debate surrounding the religious implications, but within scientific circles, change over time was already widely accepted. The Darwin uh, proposed change over time was not in any way controversial within the biological community. Many accepted it based on fossil evidence, uh, geology, and increasing knowledge of biological diversity across the world. It was the mechanism that was more controversial. And there are a couple of reasons for this. The most important is that the mode of inheritance was unknown. And, and this was critical and held up evolutionary thinking for half a century after Darwin uh, proposed evolution by natural selection. The central uh, problem is uh, the idea of blending inheritance. We clearly recognize that our children often look like both parents, or if we breed pigeons or cows or chickpeas, we understand that when we cross them, we often get offspring that are some blended component of both. And no one uh, at the time of Darwin had a widely accepted explanation for this. 
There was, however, uh, a Czech monk, uh, Gregor Mendel, who had come up with an explanation for this. However, he wrote in a language uh, that Darwin uh, did not understand well. And Darwin received tons of correspondence, and Mendel's work was largely ignored for 50 years. However, he did get the uh, idea of inheritance right. He made uh, several major contributions to our understanding. One is his law of segregation, that each gamut receives one of two alleles for each gene, and each parent contributes one randomly selected to offspring. This is the idea that there's no blending. Second is his law of independent assortment, that each trait is inherited independently from others. We now know that this is only true if genes are on separate chromosomes, uh, but uh, Mendel showed this quite well. It just happened that he was uh, working out of a monastery in Central Europe, and it wasn't until early in the 20th century that his work was rediscovered. When people rediscovered this idea, uh, it allowed for uh, the settlement of uh, the debate uh, between uh, biometricians and geneticists uh, in explaining how you can have Part, both particulate inheritance, sort of the genes that Mendel described, leading to patterns of uh, uh, variability in offspring that look like the blending inheritance that we observe. The rediscovery of Mendel's work after uh, 10 uh, contentious years uh, led to the development of the field of population genetics and the modern synthesis of evolutionary biology that brings in uh, genetics and evolution. And it was really the rediscovery of Mendel in the early 20th century that led to the birth of genetics. Genetics has never existed without evolutionary thinking. They're uh, two disciplines closely tied to one another. What the modern synthesis gives us is the idea that gradual evolution that results from small genetic changes can be acted upon by natural selection. And this is central to uh, modern evolutionary biology. Thus, the origin of species in higher taxa, or macroevolution, macro can be explained in terms of natural, selecting, natural selection acting on individuals, or microevolution. And really, this distinction between micro and macroevolution uh, is a false one, as it simply changes of, of, of genes at population levels among individuals that leads to uh, patterns of speciation. All right, so with that, I'd like to stop there and...